Lab number two is entitled Prototyping Circuits. What we're going to take a look at in lab this week is building a circuit on a solderless board. Last week we looked at using a function generator where we created a sine wave, square wave, triangle wave, in fact many other waveforms are also built into the function generator. These waveforms have an average value of zero. The function generator is also capable of having a DC offset, so it allows us to lift the waveform up or to bring the waveform below ground. This is handy in transistor level circuits where we need to place the transistor in a region with a DC level where it can actually act as an amplifier. If you were to take the function generator apart, please don't do this, and look inside of it, you'd actually see a physical 50 ohm resistor. What we're going to take a look at in this lab is why is that there and what impact does it have on the things that we're measuring. The battery is also kind of a function generator. It provides a DC voltage and it too has an equivalent circuit with a source resistance in it. Now if you cut the battery open, you wouldn't see a physical resistor there. It just simply represents a limitation of how much current you can draw from the battery. In other words, if you were to short these terminals, in fact, you don't want to do that, but if you were to short it, the most current you can get out is V sub S divided by R sub S. And what kind of values would you expect to see with a battery? So for a D cell, a fully charged battery would be about 1.6 volts. Even though it's listed as 1.5, it's a little bit higher than that when it's fully charged. And its source resistance is around 100 milliohms. But as the battery gets smaller, you can see in physical size that its source resistance also gets larger. Another property of batteries is that as you pull energy out of them, by putting loads here, this value of V sub S drops slightly. But what really happens is that this source resistance begins to increase. What that's saying is you can't draw as much current for the same load. Microphone 2 has a source resistance. And again, a voltage just like in our previous cases. So as you're speaking into the microphone, uh, you're creating a voltage, and this resistor represents how much current you can draw out of the microphone. The dynamic microphone has a magnet and a coil wrapped around it that's tied to the diaphragm. As you're speaking into it, that diaphragm is moving the coil back and forth over the magnet, and this actually creates a voltage, something on the order of 100 microvolts peak to peak. Pretty small. To be able to hear that, you have to amplify it quite a bit. And we're going to do that in one of the experiments. The source resistance for a dynamic microphone is really part of the resistance of the coil itself. and somewhere between 30 and 1,000 ohms. A crystal microphone uses a different mechanism. It uses a crystal and pressure on that crystal, pretty much like a barbecue grill, where you, if you've ever done this, where you press this little red switch and you hear a thumping noise. And what that is is a little hammer that, that smacks the crystal. And it can actually create voltages on the order of 1,000 volts. Now when you're speaking into a crystal microphone, you're going to get a lot more voltage, not thousands of volts, but much, much more for a dynamic microphone. But the source resistance is much higher because I can't take more energy out of this because I'm really putting it in with my voice. We'll take a look at some microphone measurements in lab and also how to measure this source resistance. Now if we were to put our ohmmeter on that we used last week, what would be happening is that our ohmmeter will be putting a current here through the sample and then measuring the voltage across this. But because there's already a voltage here, we'd get a false reading. So what we could do is think about, well, what are you trying to accomplish? There are two unknowns here, V sub S and R sub S. And so we would need to take two data points to solve for either or both of those. What we want to solve for really is R sub S. Suppose that we start with a known load. In other words, we measure a resistance very accurately with our digital multimeter, which we can really get a remarkable level of accuracy. And we hook this up into the circuit. Current will start to flow. The resistances can only absorb power, and so the source V sub S would generate power. So the rise in voltage here would equal the drop across the resistance and then across the load. And that's what this equation is right here. If we were to do the same thing again and put a different resistor for the load, we would draw a different current. And again, the current would be flowing in this direction. And the drop across here would be the Ohm's law notation of passive uh, sign convention. So the rise in voltage V sub S would be this drop plus this drop. That's what that second equation is. So what I've got here is V sub S is equal to the summation of these two terms, and here V sub S is equal to the summation of these two terms. So what I could do is just equate those two and then solve for the value of R sub S. So let's do that. So here I equated uh, equations three and six. Let's do a little bit of algebra here. Let's bring the R sub S term on this side of the equation. So I've got the current from our first test and our second test, and then bring this voltage on the other side. Let me divide by this term. Let me pull out a minus sign so that this represents the same subscripts on here. What these really are are measurements that we're taking. We're not really measuring current directly, 
but we're kind of measuring it indirectly by measuring the voltage across the load as we're doing our, our testing. And so I could take a change in voltage over a change in current and get the value of the source resistance. In the course, we've talked a little bit about switches, mostly in supplemental problems. Now let's talk some more about what they, what they mean. We're going to use some of these in the lab this week, but also in other experiments. A uh, toggle switch has two things or words associated with it. They're called poles and throws. Let's just take an example down here. This is called a single pole, single throw switch. The pole refers to this arm or part of the switch that is moved to open and close a circuit. And the throw is the number of circuits that are being connected. So in this case here, I'm connecting one circuit by closing and opening this switch, or just throwing the, the pole. Here I have an example of a single pole double throw. So here's my pole, and I'm connecting up one circuit, and then when I throw it, I'm connecting up a second circuit. Here's a double pole single throw. These are actually tied together, so when you flip the switch, you're actually connecting one circuit with each pole with the arm or movement of the switch. Here's a double pole double throw. So here's one pole, second pole, physically tied together in the box itself, or switch box. And as you throw the switch, you're going to connect this circuit, and then you connect it up to another circuit. Here's a photograph of what our proto board looks like. It's a board with a lot of spring clips in it, where you can push a, a wire into the hole and be able to connect other things to it. Let me show you a little bit here with this AutoCAD picture here. Let me zoom in on this a little bit, a little bit easier to show you some of the details that are here. What this consists of is two blocks, one here and an exact one down here. And I've marked some of the holes and how they're connected. There's five holes here, and they're actually all shorted together in a row. There's also another set of five holes that are shorted together, and there's about, oh, I don't know, 50 to 60 holes like this across here. So if I were to take a resistance and push it into this hole and bring it over to here, then I could bring a wire into here and connect it up to something, and a wire in here connected up to something. And that's how this set of holes works. Now this allows you to have four connections for a given insertion of a part. You can also loop over to another set of five holes and, and get four more. There are some times when we need to make a lot of connections to usually a ground or a positive power supply or a negative power supply. These are on top here. There's uh, several sets of these. They're called bus strips. And what I've got here are five, ten groupings of five that are all connected together. In this particular case, this top row is also shown connected to the chassis of the board that we're hooking up to. We're going to physically tie this to the ground in our circuit. So you can build a lot of things on this proto board. And we're going to fill it up in, in quite a few experiments, but really kind of working our way up each week as we're adding more things. Let me go back to normal size here. As I mentioned last week, every lab has a purpose. And we're dealing with concepts and techniques. This week we're looking at how to use a proto board to a quickly, quickly assemble and really disassemble a circuit without having to solder wires. The concepts that we covered in the lecture and are going to actually cover during the experiment are the accuracy of our oscilloscope, measuring source resistance in linear circuits, terminating cables to suppress reflections, this is why that 50 ohm resistor is there, pulls and throws of switches, battery performance and some of the characteristics of a battery, and microphone characterization. As far as laboratory techniques go, we're going to learn how to use the automatic parametric measurement feature that is built in to measure what's called a peak-to-peak -peak voltage. We're also going to learn how to reprogram the function generator so that uh, it's calibrated for higher impedance loads. In this case, we're going to have something that's not a 50 ohm connection. Lastly, we're going to measure DC voltages with a DC multimeter. I'd like you to read over this experiment and what when you come to lab next time, there'll be a quiz on the lab lecture and the lab background material as well as the lab experiment itself. Again, the idea here is that let you come to lab prepared having some idea what's going to happen. And this is lab number two.